Hello, everybody. Welcome to my little talk about the racing. My name is Andreas Klinger. I'm working uh, independently as embedded software engineer. Uh, but uh, originally, I'm an electronics engineer. And I'm emphasizing this because this is the way how electronic engineers are doing the measurements, how they are doing the time measurements. That's uh, exactly what I did here in this uh, in this investigation, I was measuring the overhead of the tracing framework, and I did it as we do it in the electronics, I did it with the scope. Yeah? And that's uh, why I'm emphasizing this. So, uh, I want to talk about how I did it, how I did the measurement, but I also want to show you uh, how, uh, uh, how it is done with the scope. Uh, uh, how it is set up, what I did, because you can use the same measurement principle for many other things, not just for measuring how much is the tracing. You can use it for, uh, for measuring, uh, for example, how long a protocol stake, uh, uh, takes. So uh, just by setting GPIOs and measuring them with the oscilloscope. You can measure the boot time, you know, how much time. Uh, is spent in the boot uh, in the boot process. You can toggle a GPIO in the uh, in the bootloader uh, in the Linux kernel or wherever you want. So you can toggle GPIO pins almost everywhere, and uh, that's the idea uh, which is behind uh, this uh, talk. So let's start. Yes. So this is the agenda. I wanna. Uh, talk about the scope of the measuring, what I'm doing, and then I want to go uh, systematically through the different uh, tracing mechanisms we have, and at the end to give some summaries and some output. So, probably everybody here know where this comes from. No. You don't, huh? <laughs> no, I'm saying I'm, no, you can't trust it. Yes. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so you're answering the question. <laughs> so, can we trust the values here? So, this is from the function graph tracer, and it's a snippet to, to fit it into the slide. It's not a complete output. And what we can see here are the time values it took to calculate inside of these functions. And we can also see the time values it took uh, on the, the function calling the function, so the overall time, and so on. And the question I ask myself is, can we trust these values? So why, why did I ask this question? In, the, in my last or still uh, a kind project, I uh, was facing performance problems. So I had to, uh, to do performance optimizations uh, in our uh, system. And uh, I used the tracing framework. So I'm using the tracing framework a lot. I'm really using it on, on a daily basis. And um, I was asking myself if the, the measured time values, for example, here in the function graph tracer, but not only, also with the tracing events and, and when applying filters and triggers and uh, a kernel probes and whatever, all the stuff you can do there, uh, you are getting the tracing output, you are getting time values, and are, those, are these the real time values? Can I take these time values? Or are there more or less rough estimation or somehow? So I wanted to, give, uh, to get an idea uh, what is the real overhead. So that's why I made this investigation. So, but we, wanna not, we will not jump directly to the function graph. We want to uh, start a bit more systematically. So, motivation is performance optimization. Another important point is when we are delivering our product, so when our product is finished, can we afford to deliver our product with the tracing framework or not. So what is the, the overhead? And this is something you actually can only measure from the outside, from with the scope, uh, to uh, uh, just by creating your product once with the tracing uh, framework compiled in and once to uh, compile your product uh, with the tracing compiled uh, uh, out and then to compare it. So. Yes, that's an example. Uh, that's a question we will answer in a couple of slides. So I also use different kernel configurations, and I played a lot around with kernel configurations. And um, 
at the beginning, I played around with kernel configuration to find an optimized kernel for the hardware system I have. So I optimized. It's working like this. I was juggling, uh, toggling GPIOs. I changed the kernel configuration. I applied the kernel. I was measuring and looking uh, how wide is the pulse. And uh, then I changed the kernel configuration, uh, applied this kernel, and compared it. And then I had a big paper and with a different kernel uh, configurations. And then I figured out which are the kernel configurations, the optimum kernel configurations for my board. And this is the starting point. This is where I started actually investigating about uh, how much is the tracing after that. So, and what I have put into the slides here are only two knobs, or it's just one knob, which can be either preempt, config preempt, or config preempt RT. And uh, so I want to do a simple comparison about uh, what is the difference between a kernel without preemption and uh, with preemption just and uh, with uh, preemption and real time. Um, but there are many, many more knobs, as you know. Uh, I have investigated many of them, but uh, they are not in the slides. So, yes. And there might also be a difference on how to use the tracing points. So nowadays we have many possibilities uh, on how to use the tracing uh, events. We can use them with the raw interface in the TraceFS file system. We can use the trace command or the perf programs, or we can use them with EPPF. That's also a very nice feature. And especially with the EPPF, I also did some comparisons. So there's a lot of source code, configuration, oscilloscope dumps, and also the depression at the presentation. Uh, involved and I have put everything in the cloud. So here you can see on the last three lines the, uh, the name of the cloud, the will of the cloud, the user and the, uh, and the password and I will keep it on the cloud for a couple of more weeks so you have enough time to download it uh, if you are interested in the complete details of everything. So now let's go systematically what I have measured. As you can see here, uh, First of all, the tracing event, and of course, it's the tracing event GPIO value, because this is the one uh, we, can, uh, we can monitor simply with the GPIO toggling stuff. Then I did the kernel probes. I used the histogram trigger for measuring a time span. Then I used the synthetic events for generating a histogram over these timestamps. I used the trace print K. And then the function and function graph uh, traces uh, uh, at the end from the kernel side. Um, most of these tracing facilities can be combined with filters and or triggers. I also measured this. And I have only the example with the tracing events brought in to see how much is applying a filter, how much is applying a trigger. So, but you can also combine it with the other tracing facilities. So what I have seen, it's, it's quite comparable. So I didn't see any benefits to, uh, to bring all, everything this here in the slides. So I also investigated from the user space with the, uh, syscall, with the syscall events, sysnt.io control. So I'm toggling from the user space and then I'm uh, 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 monitoring the sysenter and sysexit IO control. I used the u probes from the user space. I used trace markers and I also used the S trace program. So this is completely different story, of course, the S trace, clear. But I wanted to bring it here uh, because with the, the S trace, you can also do time measurements and uh, so that you can see. Uh, 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 what, what is the difference? It's completely different, and there's there are context switches and everything else going on. Uh, uh, so, uh, but to have an, uh, have an idea uh, how much uh, is the overhead right there. So, this is the board I used. I used the BeagleBone uh, Blackboard with 1000 kilohertz. These are the kernel versions. I, I used the long term support kernel, the latest one, which was available when I did the measurement. Um, I did, first of all, I created a kernel which was optimized for performance. And I'm not doing worst case uh, measurements 
in the sense of a real-time system. So these are not real-time worst case values, what I'm measuring here. So I'm taking the average value. That's what I'm interested in. So I wanted to know what, I'm, I'm doing performance optimization. I wanted to know what is the average overhead I have to calculate, I have to, uh, I have to uh, bring into my uh, considerations. So this is the, the snippet of the kernel driver. I was writing for this. It's a very simple kernel driver. You can get it from the cloud if you want. So the real driver is larger. So this is just a snippet to show what I'm doing. So I'm doing the, uh, the toggling. The function toggle GPIO sleep is a kernel thread. This kernel thread is running as a real-time task all the time, as fast as possible. And in this endless while loop, I'm doing this toggling five times. I'm calling the function toggle once. Maybe you're asking why I'm doing it just five times. After the five times, I'm doing the msleep. And this is just because of the uh, uh, real-time throttling. So I, don't, I, don't, I didn't want to see the real-time throttling in the scope output. Of course, I could switch off the real-time throttling, but then the question is how to, how to remove this driver without a reboot. So for me, it, the easiest thing was just to put the msleep, to relax the CPU and not run into, uh, to avoid running into the real-time throttling stuff. Uh, no. So you'd see that happen too. Yes. Yes. So preemption interrupts are still enabled, yes. Um, yes. The I created the function toggle once for being able to use um, the, the K probes, uh, the K probes on it. That's why I have this function. So otherwise, of course, I could have uh, put it into the, the loop right there. And I toggled only five times. Why five times? I'm uh, not measuring on the first cycle. It turned out measuring on the first cycle, I, I'm also measuring scenarios with a, uh, uh, with a, a cold cache. And we have seen yesterday with Jan with the cold cache, there are many things which can happen. And that's not what I want to measure here. I want to measure the overhead of the tracing and not uh, the effects of the cache. So that's why I'm uh, measuring on the second phase of the, on the second cycle uh, of, the, of it. And why I'm toggling five times, it's simply because I'm, when I'm toggling five times, I have a nice curve in the, in the scope. Yeah? So with toggling just two times, it's, only, it's not that nice. That's the reason. So, and I'm measuring with 30,000 wave counts. So this was a compromise on how long to wait for the output. So the scope is not measuring that, not able to measure that fast. And uh, we could, uh, uh, so it, it takes some, some time to do the measurement and, and everything. And, but randomly, I did it 500 times for verifying if the result is the same, if I do it 500 times. So 500 times is running the oscilloscope over the night to the next day. Yeah. That's why it's 500 days. 500 times. So this is the output of the oscilloscope you will see later. So we have the high, the positive uh, pulse, this is the T high, and we have the uh, negative pulse. I'm taking the positive pulse as for comparison. And I'm also calculating the duty cycle. You see it here on the bottom. Oh, to be honest, I'm not calculating it. The scope is calculating it. So the scope is also calculating the duty cycle. Why is this interesting? Because sometimes the duty cycle, of course, should be around 50%. But sometimes the duty cycle is not around 50%. And then we have to ask ourselves why. What's the reason for this? And there are some outputs where, I, where there's some uh, uh, additional explanation. Uh, needed exactly because of this. So now we are at the first real output, the real comparison. So here I'm comparing the uh, 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 I'm comparing uh, a kernel with a minimal configuration without tracing compiled in. It's a kernel without the tracing, and uh, with preemption and with real time and preemption. So on the left side, it's a minimal kernel without real-time, and on the right side, with, on the right side, it's with 
uh, real time. And uh, you can see here, these are the, the pulses, and this is what the, uh, the scope has measured. And the mean time here is 141 and 145 for the positive pulse. And for the negative pulse, it would be the other way around. It's longer for the standard kernel uh, as for the real-time kernel. But the duty cycle seems to be more precise on with the real-time page. So this is not significant difference. And yes, uh, we can say it's, uh, uh, it's a good work with the real-time kernel, so that it's producing almost the same. And it seems to be it's a bit more precise, it's more, uh, more strict uh, uh, toggling it. You can get all these configurations from the cloud. So these are the names of the files. And this is the comparison. So there's just this one knob with the real time is compared. So sometimes we can see there are two waves here. This does not mean anything. It's because of the scope. So there's one point of type when I'm pressing the point screen on the scope. And uh, sometimes I'm getting one and sometimes I'm getting two waveforms. Yeah? So it's a feature or bug, whatever, of the scope. It has nothing to say. So because of this, I selected the real-time kernel. And the real-time kernel without, uh, without uh, tracing compiled in takes 145 nanoseconds for one uh, switch. Now let's take this kernel and switch on the tracing. And I'm switching here. This is what I did. I'm jumping the, the output. So these are the knobs I switched on. And with these knobs, I made the whole presentation. Of course, you, might, you could say not all the knobs are necessary if doing a simple trace event, of course. So I wanted to have just one configuration for which I, I'm doing the whole presentation. So each of these knobs, of course, has some, has some effects. That's, that's for clear. So with these knobs, this is the output. The difference is uh, 145 to 168, so 23 nanoseconds, which is 16%. Or uh, I did the same with the standard kernel where it was 19%. So this is the overhead which comes in if we are delivering our system, our systems with the real-time uh, patch included on the target side. So very often we wish, we want, to, uh, we want to deliver our systems with the tracing framework because this offers us a lot of facilities for doing uh, for, for, for doing measurement, for doing uh, error uh, detection and kind of things. And, and this is the cost, yeah, what I have measured. So everyone, this is, of course, this is for this hardware. For different hardware can be different, of course. That's for clear. So, but the, the setup, how I measured, is quite simple. So everyone can do this measurement. And um, because on, on our system, on our project, we are very, very close. We are very short with the... Uh, with the uh, calculation time, we are, uh, we are delivering without the tracing uh, framework, unfortunately, unfortunately, um, uh, but because we have to, we need to save the, let's say, the last 16%. So it's the function tracing, not the tracing. What do you say? Function tracing is what caused the delay. Yes. It adds, adds adding above. Yes, yes. So that, that's what I said. If every knob is adding some, some overhead, yes. What do you say? So, um, yes. So, so this is the important value with which we will continue with 168 nanoseconds. So this is. Um, and this is also our reference configuration. So with this reference configuration, now I'm switching on the tracing events. And so this is the, the matrix with all the values. As this stands for standard deviation. So now I'm switching on the a tracing event. So this is the reference configuration, the GPIO value event. 
And as you can see, with switching on a tracing event, we are at 1.36 microseconds. So on Monday, I have heard about 100 nanoseconds, but probably you're talking about Intel systems. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so, so I have verified this measurement uh, and with other ARM systems, so I'm working mostly on ARM, so this is realistic. So we are about one microseconds. That's more or less the case. Yeah. So, and so that's the overhead. This tracing event brings uh, uh, brings uh, with it. So, uh, depending on what you are doing, this is much, or it's not much. It depends on what you are doing. So, for most purposes. Uh, it's not that much to have one microseconds. You can still live with it. But if you are doing uh, GPIO bit banging drivers, so I also did some drivers where we are, uh, do, uh, where we are uh, grating the clock with, the, with GPIOs and doing this kind of stuff, if you are, want to trace something like this, you could... No, no, no. Oh, yeah, you want to jump yeah, we'll it first. Yes. Okay, so you were right, yes. Yes. Now jump, so you might want to mention generally that jump labels uh, will make a no op when the tracing is off, so maybe we're not seeing it until it's uh -huh. the valves. Uh -huh. Okay, I, I'm interested. Yeah, thank you. So, um, yes. Now I, with this tracing event, I also tried many events. I changed the driver so that we have uh, uh, so that we have many events in it, so that um, so that I can uh, uh, enable many events uh, in it. Uh, so I created individual events, and with individual, I made up to ten individual events. We can see it's it's uh, increasing. The time is increasing linearly. Yes, that's what I expected. Just to to verify. Then I uh, uh, used filters. I was filtering on the GPIO number 17, 70. So this is the GPIO I'm printing out right here. And with the GPIO 70, uh, the, uh, uh, the overhead is additional 280 nanoseconds. And with enabling uh, trigger, here I enabled the trigger. The overhead is another 120 nanoseconds. It's a simple trace on trigger right here. Uh, just to see what is, uh, uh, how much it takes. We can also combine filters and triggers, then we can just add sum up. Yeah. I don't have slides about this, but it's just a matter of summing it up yeah, if we are combining them. So now I, I was using the histogram tracer, and I created a synthetic event. What I wanted to do is, I wanted to measure the pulse wide with the histogram trigger. That's the purpose of this. So I'm doing what I'm doing with the scope, I'm doing now in the software, exactly the same. And I wanna look what, what's the difference, if there's a difference or not. So, um, so I created a synthetic event here, and the rising, on the rising edge, I'm remembering the timestamp, the common timestamp, and on the falling edge, I'm uh, calculating the delta t, the, delta t uh, the time delta, and uh, if it matches this event, I'm uh, uh, raising this synthetic event, this GPIO high, which is uh, defined right here. So, and the output looks like this. And the latency we get here, this is the measured time, the pulse, there's a positive pulse wide, uh, wide the histogram tracer has measured, which is here 2.4 microseconds or 2.3 microseconds. So it's a, you can see it's already a bit more than it was in reality. And the output of the scope is like this. So now we have 4.77 microseconds. So it adds some overhead. And the amazing thing maybe is that the duty cycling now is not 
around 50%. So as you can see, it's not symmetrically anymore. So what's the reason why? So one might think on the rising edge, we are just remembering the timestamp, and on the falling edge, we are calculating the timestamp and inserting the, the synthetic event. So it should be the other way around. Yes, uh, should be. It's not the case. So the reason is because if you look into the kernel sources, you can see that uh, just before doing actually calling the driver for switching the GPIO to low, the tracing event is called. So the overhead is not included here in the negative pulse, it's included in the positive pulse. So here, the insertion of the, uh, of the, uh, of the synthetic event is done here. That's the reason why, it's like, why it looks like this. And that's important why it's also, uh, why I'm all, and that's exactly why I'm also looking at the, at the uh, duty cycle to be, uh, being able to clarify such situations. Yeah? So it's, it's not a bad thing, it's how it is implemented, that's it. So if one knows that it's implemented like this, I think we can live with, with it. So. so now the additional overhead is 3.4 microseconds in comparison to the normal tracing event. The histogram trigger brings with it. So, so this is the function where you can look, where you can see this, what I just explained. So, now I want to get a histogram out of this information and uh, I'm, uh, I just need to activate the synthetic event. So I just need to add a, a histogram trigger to the synthetic event with the latency buckets of 100 uh, nanoseconds and I'm sorting for this latency value and the output looks like this. So we are getting here for each uh, time uh, period, the number of uh, hit counts we have. So I abbreviated here. And this is, yes. Uh, and uh, what I did then is I did some AWK stuff for bringing it in the form to be able to, uh, to print it with, uh, uh, with new plot. Then I did the, uh, did the new plot. And I also calculated with AWK uh, the average pulse wide, pulse wide uh, with the standard and here with the real time kernel. And the average pulse wide here is 2.8 microseconds. I calculated out of the data I got here. And this is the new plot diagram. Oh, oh sorry. Um, yes. So it's logarithmic uh, on the uh, on the uh, on the base scale. So and this is the the output from the scope. So now we are we are at five point nine microseconds. Duty cycle the same effect with uh, uh, with the one before, and uh, yes. So now I did the same with eBPF. So with eBPF, uh, we can also uh, use the, the GPIO value uh, 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 event. And when the value of this event is one, I'm once again remembering the time. And when the value goes to uh, zero, then I'm, uh, I'm calculating the the uh, time difference and I'm doing the quantize and I'm using the program ply. So ply is a very small, especially for small embedded systems, uh, created uh, uh, program for interfacing the EPPF. Yeah. So and with the ply, I'm getting this histogram. So the histogram is not that nice as we had with the tracing framework and the synthetic events. Uh, the reason is because the ply from its implementation, oh, from its implementation, it's only able to use bucket, uh, uh, buckets here, uh, which are increasing in powers of two. 
that's because of the implementation. So it's using a bit mask internally, and and that's the reason why uh, this output is not is not that nice as we have with the tracing framework. But the overhead is a bit a bit less uh, as we had uh, uh, how I used the, the tracing framework before. So now let's go to the kernel probes. I use the kernel probes, as you can see here. I use them on the function GPO D set value. This is the function which is called whenever the GPO is toggled to one or to zero. So this is comparable to our GPO value. And I'm pointing out uh, any string and a value. So this is the, the output I, I got right here. So it's about 2.96 microseconds. So the overhead to being untraced, now we are going back to the untraced version, not to the tracing event, to the untraced version is 2.79 microseconds. That's the overhead of the, uh, of the kernel probe. Once again, I did this check with the linearity. Yes, that's the case. So I created a special driver by, by, where, in which I was calling the function uh, 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 10 times. So we had a, had a backtrace of 10 functions and I added uh, one by one uh, the kernel probes and measured what was the time value. So I did the kernel probes with the EPPF. We have 3.68 microseconds, which is, let me go back, which is more than with the simple kernel probes, but there's a little bit more of logic in there. So now, so these are the tracing events and the kernel probes. Now let's go to the uh, function and function graph tracers. So I, uh, when I'm uh, enabling the function tracer, I did it here with the raw interface, just writing function to the current tracer file. We are getting this output and um, in this Uh, and, and I'm also doing a, a, a filtering. I'm filtering for GPIOD, and with G, when G, um, filtering for GPIOD, I'm getting three output lines for each toggling. So there are three functions shown for each toggling when I'm filtering. So on the left side, you can now see uh, it takes us 4.64 microseconds, one toggling, without filtering. And on the right side, it's 3.38 microseconds. So what I have seen with the function trace work is that, the, that as soon as just one function is enabled, there's a certain amount of overhead, which is most of the overhead. It's, a, it's around three microseconds, this overhead. And with each additional tracing event, there is additional overhead, but it's not increasing that much. So with the, with the function trace framework, as soon as we are, we are tracing the first function, we have most of the overhead already. So it's half of the overhead. And uh, with each additional function, the overhead is not increasing that much. It's increasing slowly. So it does not make so much difference to, uh, to trace a lot of function or only a couple of functions. As soon as we have activated it, uh, the half of the overhead is already taking place. So doing the same with the function graph tracer, now I selected once again the same example with the GPO D set value with free uh, function calling here. We can see the function graph tracer tells us 16.292 microseconds. We already know that it's a little bit more than, than in the real world. Um, and looking at the scope, we can see the output is at 12 microseconds. And with the function graph tracer, I didn't, know, I didn't see a difference if I'm uh, filtering to this function or not in the positive pulse wide. In the negative pulse wide, there was a little bit difference. So with the function graph tracer, I saw only little difference when filtering or not. Yes?
Mm -hmm. So, um, set graph function still has everything tracing. It just will not write to the ring buffer or not. If you use set function f trace filter, then it only traces what you want. So this is a, it's kind of yeah. Okay, so. Mm -hmm. There we go. So okay. So um, so set graph function will actually still actually trace and go through all the overhead of the function graph tracer okay. and just decides whether or not to write to the buffer or not. Uh -huh. If you use set f trace filter only on that function, then mm. it, it only gets called. And actually, usually the leaf functions are the most accurate. But when you have a function graph that traces a function graph that traces a function function graph or set graph functions only just so I could see what's being called within a single function. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't make it any fa actually, I tell people don't trust the numbers because it doesn't make it any faster. So mm -hmm. if you want to speed things up, don't use set graph function. You actually have to use set after each filter to uh -huh. speed things up. So uh, yeah, I expected that it would be the exact same because mm -hmm. all the overhead is still there. Mm -hmm. you, by using set graph function, you did not remove anything that okay. causes the o overhead to go uh -huh. away. Okay, so thank you. Thank you very much. I can, I can uh, repeat it. I will repeat it at home and, and try it if it makes a difference. Thank you. So. I think we are a little bit short in time, five minutes. Okay. So, uh, yes, I did the trace point K. Uh, with trace point K, I got 1.22 microseconds. I was surprised. I thought it would be more than a tracing event. It's not. So you're not surprised? No, it's made for debugging. It's made for debugging race conditions. So it was highly optimized to be yes. very, very fast. Yes. So it's quite fast compared to even faster than the tracing event. But this trace point K is not uh, printing any values. It's just a string printed out here. So and this is the summary on, uh, uh, on the overhead. So uh, this is the system with tracing compiled in. Uh, it takes 1.19 microseconds to enable the GPIO uh, value, and then you can see uh, what is the additional overhead uh, with the his trigger and the synthetic event, with uh, triggers on the uh, tracing event, and with filters, and with the other tracing facilities we have here. Yeah. So, now let's go quickly through the user space. I did also the toggling in the user space, so this is once again, a small program in the user space. And from the user space, it took me 1.58 microseconds to toggle once without any tracing. So and what we can see here, the overhead between 0.19 and 158, so it's about 1.4 microseconds. This is the overhead which comes from the syscall and the VFS. So this is the overhead which comes for calling a syscall. And this is always the overhead we have in the user space. So we can also use this type of measurement for measuring what is the uh, overhead of a syscall. We can uh, measure what is the overhead of the sysfs. We can measure what is the overhead of libraries and all this kind of stuff. That's also what I'm, what I'm doing sometimes. And uh, so, but this is now our reference for the user space, 1.58 microseconds. Now we are enabling the tracing events, the sysenter and sysexit IO control. And we are getting 3.94 microseconds, which is an overhead of 2.36 microseconds. But we need to be careful. There are two tracing events for one toggling. So to compare it with the GPIO value tracing event, we need to divide it by, by two, and then we have an overhead of around one or two microseconds. So it's in the same uh, in the same range once again. So I also used the U probes, and this is the U probe. I used it with the program perf because perf is nicely calculating all the all the offsets and kind of stuff. So we don't need to use the object dump. And um, with the U probe, we are getting 16 microseconds. So it's, yes, a bit more than uh, we get with uh, the kernel probes in the kernel, where we have been around the two dot something microseconds. Um, and I'm only doing the U probe only on one uh, 
uh, uh, on, on the, uh, only on the, on the rising edge. Yeah? And once again, we have the effect that it's here, this is the overhead is here on the high pulse high phase. So we have 14 microseconds of overhead. I did the trace marker. I did it like it, it's documented in the kernel sources. And with the trace marker, I measured an uh, overhead of 5.81 microseconds. Oh, sorry, not the overhead. The time, the overhead was 4.2 microseconds for one trace marker from the user space. And finally, I used the program S trace with, uh, and with the F -trace, S trace, we are getting around 93, 94 microseconds. So this is not comparable, of course. I just wanted to give you this number so that you see what's, what's the overhead of the S trace. Of course, it's a completely different story. Yeah, just for, for comparison. So this is the overview. I have a couple of more slides. What else can be done with this measurement? But I think we, we ran out of time. So uh, you can read the slides. We don't have time for questions, but uh, and I need to leave anyway. Uh, <laughs> so uh, if, if you have any questions or you have any suggestions, Please write me an email. The email is contained in the, on the first slide. So uh, I am happy to hear your suggestions. What can I improve with my measurement? Of course. Thank you for audience. Thank you.